Spider-Man is not only an iconic hero in the superhero world, but is also one of the most profitable media franchises of all time. The webhead has been around everywhere, swinging from comic books to TV series, movies, video games, and serials. Hell, he's even been part of the Elsa gate. Huh, remember that whole controversy last year? Yeah, Spider-Man has been getting a great reputation since then. The point I'm trying to make here is that he's been famous in a large variety of media. Although there have been a scarce amount of Spider-Man movies that stay true to the comic book adaptations, like the Sam Raimi trilogy or Homecoming. When I saw the first trailer for Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, I was quite skeptical because Sony Pictures Animation was not only the studio that is going to be behind it, but they also made Bear in Forest, Pirates of the Man. Monsters Hotel The Cash Grab and Big Yikes. But then later I learned that Phil Lord and Christopher Miller were going to be behind this movie. And I had some hope because they did some pretty good work. The Lego movies except for the Lego Ninjago, which I haven't seen, were all mostly great and I enjoyed them. Along with Cloudy The Chance of Meatballs, the first movie. Those were all pretty good works and I enjoyed them so far. So I had some trust that they could do something great out of this movie. And then January 2019 rolled, the new year. I went to watch it a few days ago with my family, and I walked into it filled with just as much hype as I could hold in. I later walked out of the theater with my expectations surpassed beyond the limits. The team behind the movie consisted of directors Bob Perischetti, Peter Ramsey and Rodney Rothman. Phil Lord was the writer and also produced alongside Christopher Miller. All of them alongside with the voice actors and the other crew for the movie worked together to bring this to fruition. This masterpiece that I can proudly say was well done. After attending the first day of school, Miles Morales runs off to visit his uncle for some street side venturing. Miles later gains his powers from a radioactive spider and accidentally encounters Spider-Man attempting to shut down an interdimensional collider ray built by the team under Kingpin's rule. The collider is unfortunately activated, but only for a brief moment that's enough to drag in all the Spider-Verse characters that we learn and love throughout the movie, along with killing the original Spider-Man and replacing him with a more slob-like version of him. The Spider-Verse characters gather together to mentor Miles on honing his abilities and in the end, make a team effort to stop Kingpin from clashing dimensions before the original one gets completely damaged. Alright, let's get down to the pros and cons. I'm gonna start with the pros. Now as someone who's pursuing animation as part of my career, it's pretty obvious that the animation and art style is the most important aspect when I'm reviewing an animated movie. Now I have quite a lot to say about how the visuals of Into the Spider-Verse looks, but let's hold that for some other stuff for the meantime. How about we start with the plot and writing? The movie shows a great amount of character development throughout the runtime. Most of the Spider-Man adaptations are supposed to focus not only on the development of the Spider-Man alter ego, but also view the normal life that Peter Parker lives. And that's exactly what we see in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Of course not with Peter Parker, but instead with Miles Morales. We can easily relate and empathize with Miles on how he deals with balancing two different worlds on his shoulders as well as the message that genuinely helping others in need is all that it takes to make a difference. He also has more time to start grasping his newfound powers with the help of the Spider-Verse characters rather than starting off strong with the lack of training. Or in other words, rather than writing him off as a Gary Stu. One of the things that I haven't noticed in my first and only viewing but agree with later on is that in Chris Tuckman's review, he points out how Miles eventually learns that by being persistent and optimistic, it gets easier being a hero. Spider-Man as a person and Peter Parker, they're, it's a character that's been beaten down so much, that's dealt with so much shit in their lives, but they're still maintaining some optimism. And Miles Morales is very much so the same. He's a character dealing with so much, but he's able to pull himself out of it, and that's why you love him. Another great part that I enjoyed in the movie is its comedic relief. All the jokes and comedic writing contained doesn't feel forced or dumbed down. It executes it well because Into the Spider-Verse doesn't try to pander to 
either the younger or the adult audiences with the comedic direction. I generally loved all the dialogue and jokes that the movie brought in, and so did a lot of the audience as I was watching. In fact, one of the funniest moments was the post credit scene. Now, unfortunately, I didn't get to see it at the cinema because I was watching it at the last screening, which was really late for everyone. But I did manage to find some footage online. If you're going to watch this movie, I urge you not to skip the post credit scene because it's really incredible and it would make your experience a lot better as well as mine. In addition, the movie also doesn't spend too much time narrating the origin story for Miles Morales or even for all the other Spider-Verse characters. So they kind of introduced the characters up really short enough for the audience to quickly familiarize with them and still have room for a more deeper dive into the main plot. One thing that has been a flaw in some of the least successful Spider-Man movies like Spider-Man 3 or The Amazing Spider-Man 2 builds too many villains from the ground up to pose as just about the same threat as the first main one. However, I'm pleased that Into the Spider-Verse doesn't do this and it doesn't fall into that pile. While it does contain a handful of villains, the movie doesn't try to shove them all as the main antagonist because they're all just lackeys hired by the mob boss Kingpin. The plot isn't the most innovative part of the movie, but it was still executed fantastically. It doesn't draw into other incomplete subplots, nor does it run into too many plot holes. There is also a great amount of references and easter eggs that pay a loving tribute to a lot of Spider-Man adaptations. As I sat throughout the movie, I really recognized a lot of them and sure I'm not the most hardcore Spider-Man fan, but I can still appreciate the theme behind the movie were really enthusiastic about the mythos and works that the web slingers participated in, and it clearly shows how much they respect them. The original score for the movie was alright. It wasn't the most exciting thing or something that I would constantly listen to even after the movie, but it does the movie justice and it fits well for most of the scenes. It doesn't ruin the experience at all. Daniel Pemberton does a pretty good job creating the musical atmosphere for a lot of the scenes. And just by listening to the first few seconds for most of the tracks, I can immediately picture the scenes that implemented them, just not very clearly or even precise. Another interesting thing that I didn't realize is that some of the sound effects, like the ones present in the Prowlers theme, had a creative audio engineering process to perfect those roars, and I noticed that thanks to Houston Productions Review. The composer of the score, Daniel Pemberton, um, is also on Twitter, and he's been sharing a ton of like behind the scenes things of how they did the score, which keep impressing me. You know, they he talks about how uh, like there's the sound of a spray can is used for part of Miles' theme, and the like roaring screeching sound that the Prowler makes when he's on screen is actually an elephant noise distorted. <laughs> I actually didn't notice the score of the movie the first time that I saw it. I wasn't that impressed. But then after I went home and listened to it on my own and then went back and saw the movie, I've, I've fallen in love with the score for the film. Finally, I saved the best for last. The most prominent feature of the movie and the best one that I loved about it is the animation and art style. Not only does the art direction look so vibrant and vivid, but the movie literally screams comic book with its visuals. According to a Slash Film interview with the directors, Ferris Getty details how the animation has mostly incorporated traditional 2D and 3D CGI mediums to create a spectacular aesthetic. He also explained that they had to heavily rework the CGI animation algorithms in order to animate mostly in 2D, since every CGI animation algorithm usually creates a new frame for every moment the object is moved. And in the video by Adobe Creative Cloud that was linked in the same article, one of the directors stated that it took about two years to experiment and rework their initial ideas to consolidate into one final art style that suited this movie perfectly. Howard Wimshurt, an animator that offers some incredibly informative videos, shares his insight and understanding of the animation that is brilliantly executed by Into the Spider-Verse. It a more graphic, handmade style. They didn't just put all of the animation on twos indiscriminately either. In this shot of Miles jumping off the crane, we can see that the whole thing is kept on ones because the smooth feeling of ones is appropriate for that kind of graceful movement. This is something that I've also noticed, but I wouldn't have done as great of an explanation as he did. 
In addition, he also observed the incredible amount of detail each Spider-Verse character has into them. In terms of motion, for example, Gwen moves in grace and swift motion that resembles elegance and focus as part of her traits, while in contrast, Maz has this unpredictable and rushed movement that describes his freaky nature. There's also a visible difference based in the art direction and style of each character. Like how Spider-Ham appears similarly to wacky cartoon visuals, Spider-Man Noir is designed with a grayscale scheme to represent the film noir era that he originates from. And Penny Parker looks like an anime character. Now I could go on praising more about the look of the movie, but you get the idea and you can clearly tell from the trailers and other footage online. Also I think you should check out the full video that Howard made because there's way too much about the animation and art style that I wouldn't be able to fit into this video and also because he provides some great insight into it. As much as I love this movie, I do have a few issues with it, but nothing that greatly ruined the experience, just I guess some nitpicks. The problem with movies like these unfortunately is that it's difficult for critics to try to be unbiased because there's an overwhelming amount of positives and negatives. Although, I want to make it perfectly clear that I'm not trying to look for every tiny part of the movie that I can use to hate on it. Anyway, let's start off with the first con. I didn't really like much of the licensed soundtrack. Now, that's not to say I hate all the music there. There was one song that I kind of liked, and it's uh, Sunflower by Post Malone and Sway Lee. But even then, it's not the best one. It's just an alright one at most. That's not to say that they shouldn't belong to the movie, because I understand that they work well with the world that Miles lives in, in Brooklyn. Although some of the tracks don't seem to work well with certain scenes. Of course, I do like some other music in the same genre that the soundtrack belongs in, which is hip-hop and rap. But it's just that this soundtrack style didn't appeal to me a lot. Kingpin, while written as a decent villain, had a questionable motive. He wasn't the worst antagonist in this movie, let alone a bad one at all. It's just that his reasoning to use the collider was contradictory and made no sense at all. I still enjoyed the movie nevertheless and he was an alright villain. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse not only surpasses the creative potential with recreating different adaptations using some innovative storytelling, but it also shows in the animation and art style as well as the sound design. This is one of the most outstanding movies I've ever seen, let alone as an animated film. Into the Spider-Verse is a spectacular movie, and something that a lot of people can enjoy. From casual moviegoers to hardcore comic book enthusiasts, this movie has the potential to bring together a lot of people to enjoy. But of course, to each is to their own opinion. If you didn't like this movie, that's perfectly fine, although I can't really understand why. Maybe you can explain it in the comments below, and maybe it might make sense. And one more thing, don't miss out this movie over Aquaman. I'd say the same thing even if I watched Aquaman the first time. 